We again are reflecting through themes of the chapters 21 through 23. So we've been in chapters 21 through 23. Ironically enough, this will be the third week, and we are in theme number three. I said Genesis, didn't I? I all messed up. Exodus. You know, Genesis. Moses wrote them both. Um, yes, Exodus, chapters 21 through 23. The topic of tonight is an interesting topic. Maybe I'm nervous. That's why I said Genesis. Or maybe there was something with this is when they were created. But anyway, the topic of tonight and the title of tonight is the value of women. And as I was talking with Angel throughout the several weeks in preparation for this, she's like, Chad, I have read the Old Testament, and I have read Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and I don't know how you're going to pull out a value of women in the verses that I've read. And so she's kind of a skeptic when it comes to this, um, and I assured her, hey, the Old Testament values women greatly, and you have to look in culture, and you have to move through the nuances of what people thought in that day, but we will see tonight that God very much values women. And that his objective, which Angel doesn't doubt that, obviously, um, and his objective is to move his people to understand and to acknowledge and to value the awesomeness of femininity. And so we're going to get involved in that tonight. When we, from our Western culture, so we're going to start right away with culture, okay? And this kind of moves into Angel's sentiment as well. When we, from our Western culture, read ancient Eastern biblical law, even when reading it in English, the message frequently gets lost in translation. We don't understand pain for a bride, and we're going to get to that point, especially as we move through this theme. What does it mean to pay for a bride? We immediately assume that women were treated as property and not protected. I mean, that's just how we are wired in our Western culture. When we hear a bride price, then we immediately think, well, women were referred to as property, and so what do I have to learn from this? But this is absolutely not the case. So as we engage in what the Old Testament has to say and what Moses wants us to hear in God's revelation of his law, then we really need to understand what's going on here. So if you want to turn with me to chapter 22, and I'm going to be looking at verse 16. Chapter 22, verse 16 says this. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father, father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal should be put to death, and it continues. It goes through many objections of the, or many parts of the law. One, two short verses, verses 16 and 17. But as you read through the Mosaic Law, as you read through the first five books of the Old Testament, and I'm going to refer to many of those passages this evening, you see this thought of pain to betroth, pay to engage, pay to have the proper movement towards marriage. Now again, I know that when you read these kinds of things, you just go through it and skip, skip, skip. I mean, we've been through this. I understand. This is a difficult thing to move through. But the real motivation behind the custom of a bride price. So in verse 16, you immediately see this word, this phrase, paying the price for a bride. You see the real motivation behind that actually has four different aspects to it. Number one is this, an unwavering financial responsibility. As you move towards the custom and the culture and the understanding of what was about to take place between a man and a woman, that it was essential that the man was able to provide financially for the family that was about to start. And so immediately when you get into this, the motivation behind pain 
a, a father and household for the privilege of marrying his daughter had to do with financial responsibility. It also was the fact that you couldn't avoid that responsibility. That's number two. This pain, the price, could not be avoided. So in verse 16, it says, if you slept with someone, all right, and then you decided, well, I really didn't want the commitment that that came, it didn't matter. You still had to pay the bride price. You still went to the father. And that woman could either become your wife or not become your wife, and we'll learn later that that was up to the dad, but the price still had to be paid. And so what it's moving toward is this institution, this relationship, this human as a female and this human as a male has value, not value that you just immediately put a dollar amount towards, but a value of responsibility. And so we immediately move to what is a bride price? What does it mean? What does it entail? It entails financial responsibility. It entails absolute, you cannot avoid this. It also forced a man to make a full and formal arrangement for marriage. It meant that you had to take initiative. It meant that you had to plan as a guy who wanted to court a girl. It means you had to have an idea of, whoa, this is a commitment that God holds in very, very high standards and with a huge degree of quality. The fourth thing is this. It affirmed God's view and design for the sacred act of marriage. That as you read through the Old Testament law, what it really does is it upholds the view that God has of the covenant of marriage. Now, last week we talked about a certain type of law. We talked about Talion law, lex talionis. And so it moved us into an understanding of what we talked about with an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this week we're going to move to another fun word to kind of throw around and say your vocabulary is expanding, and it's this casuistic law. And so as you look at this form of law that's showing up in Moses relating what God has to say about the subject, this is the kind of law that it is. And this is basically what it says. This law went into effect when a man and a woman had engaged in premarital sex without the proper betrothal and marriage arrangement, including the bride price. So that's when this law went into effect, when that circumstance was happening. And here's the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to start marriage according to God's plan. So God has a plan for marriage. God created man and woman, and he created both of them in his image. He put his worth on both male and female. When you read in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, you read the purpose of God not only in male and female personhood, you also read the purposes of God in the roles of marriage as God begins to outline what Adam will be responsible for and what Eve will be responsible for. You see the roles of marriage come alive in Genesis and then continue to play itself out through the biblical narrative. And so as we get kind of bunkered down on this whole idea of the value of women and the price of a bride, what I want you to rise to the surface is the purpose of this, as you read this, and you read the instruction, the purpose is the value of marriage and the preparation that is necessary for a man to rightfully give a woman what she needs in finances, in emotions, in care, in tenderness, in security. It goes right back into the role of men as lead, protect, and provide. And so as you look at this, this is where the law is headed. Now many of you have heard this when it comes to marriage, that marriage is what? A form of covenant. In fact, it is a covenant. It is a formal covenant. You are entering into a promise. When you choose to move towards marriage, you are saying, I, before God, am going to enter into a marriage relationship with you, and it is binding. It is a formal covenant. Marriage exists for what? For God's glory. The weight of God's presence exists in people's marriages. 
It exists to display God. Marriage is patterned after Jesus' covenant relationship with his redeemed people, the church. God is saying to us when we look at marriage, he is saying to us, I want your marriage to display the type of beauty, to display the type of commitment, to display the type of sacrificial giving and serving that Christ has displayed in what he has done for the church. That's the example of marriage. And so as you begin to think about marriage and you begin to think about this amazing covenant that God has set up for us to walk into, God is saying, you see the relationship that Jesus has with the church? That's what I want people to glean from when they watch your marriage. I want them to watch your marriage and say, whoa, look at how he serves her. Look at how she loves him. Look how they move in tandem to the beat of the glory of God. That is the movement towards marriage. The highest meaning of marriage is to put the covenant relationship of Jesus and his church on display. And then this covenant is sealed through what? It's sealed through consummation. It is an actual flesh upon flesh bonding covenant experience. You can't just treat a relationship between a man and a woman as flippant. Let's go back to verses 16 and 17. I want you guys to begin to create a framework. Create a framework. Why did God design marriage? What is the value of men? What is the value of women? What's the responsibility of men when it comes to moving towards marriage? Verse 16, again, let's read it. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. Now, this particular passage is not talking about the woman saying no. This is talking about mutual consent when it comes to two adults entering into a physical type of relationship. So you need to read that, okay? So as these two adults enter into a physical type of relationship, it's saying no matter what, that person either becomes your wife or doesn't, but you're still paying the bride price. You're still moving towards responsibility when it comes to your actions, especially concerning physical touch, physical engagement. Verse 17. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, here's the whole thing. Dad's saying, hey, I don't care what you guys decided to do in the dark of the night or in the light of the day. You are not getting married. This is not a good situation. And so you still have to pay. You still have to own up to the responsibility. That's where the law is going. He shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. Now, as you think through all of this, this exchanging of flesh has a value. Think about it. It's not as simple as true love waits. This isn't what we're talking about here, although that's a good movement, okay? The exchanging of flesh has a value. And from the beginning, God is establishing the value of sexual relationships, the value of marriage, the value of men and women coming together. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says this, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Again, the intention is it doesn't matter what the relationship is. If you are going to enter into a flesh-to-flesh -flesh relationship, God sees that as value. And the question for us as children of God is to say, then what do we do in response to the value that God has put on that? Again, you can't treat a relationship between a man and a woman flippantly, and the cost of sex is not $50, or $100, or $300, or $500. The cost of sex is a movement towards lifelong commitment when it comes to responsibility. That is God's norm. 
And so we as his children have to begin to understand what is God's norm and how do we move through a broken world. Whether formal marriage is allowed or not by the woman's protector, who in this verse is the dad, compensation is required. I hope you're beginning to understand those two verses as we move further into this concept of the value of women. The point of covenant marriage is that the man, the woman, hear this, and both families are involved. That's the point. The man's involved, the woman's involved, both families are involved, and the price showed the seriousness and importance. It wasn't that each family it was one standard price. And it wasn't based on how the woman looked that the price went up. That, that's not what this is about. Don't compare it to some bartering system. That's not what it was. The price that was put and negotiated and talked about within the family structure was there to show the worth of this tremendous woman, this amazing daughter. Ask me the price of my three daughters, right? I mean, it's astronomical, by the way. No one can afford it, all right? I mean, as you think through it, that's the kind of responsibility that's going on here. The price is showing the seriousness. So if you nailed me to the wall, I would resist heavily. But if you nailed me to the wall and said, if there was a good, godly suitor for one of my daughters, and eventually they were at the age where they wanted to be married, and you had to nail me to the wall and said, Chad, what price shows the seriousness of marriage? Then I would have to think of a price. And I would have to think and consider, who is this guy? What is his financial means? Is it easy for him to attain? You know, is he a, a, a heir to billions of dollars? And so if I give a price tag that he can just pull out of his pocket, that's not good, right? It's got to cost him something. So if you think about these family arrangements, it wasn't about every woman is worth this much. No. It's the family sitting together and saying, is this guy serious? Is this guy ready for the responsibility that it's going to take to marry my daughter? There's the value of women, not the price. Are you starting to connect the dots? That's what these verses are beginning to talk about. The joys of marriage were deemed honorable and in many ways priceless. Had the man taken the time to prove his worthiness was the question. Had the man taken the time to prove his worthiness? Is she worth it? I often enter into conversations with guys who are in the awkward stage of dating. And they're like, I just don't know if I should ask her out, or I just don't know if she's a real pain in this area, or she's really annoying me in this area, or I just can't ever please her, or, you know, I mean, you can think of a hundred different excuses, right? Or a hundred different situations, and every single guy in there is going, yeah, okay, right, right. right? Well, here's some good public advice. The question is this, is she worth it? Period. That's the question. We're not devaluing women in is she worth it. We're saying, are you willing to do whatever it takes to win her heart? Whatever it takes. Are you willing to put up with the stubbornness? Are you willing to put up with the fact that she's the most beautiful thing that walks this planet and other guys look? Are you willing to move towards this commitment of relationship? And so as you think through this whole movement of marriage and this whole movement of joy, has the guy taken the time to really understand the question, is she worth it? You see, a one-night stand proves nothing but immaturity, selfishness, and ultimately idolatry. A one-night stand proves nothing because it's all about self. It has nothing to do with the value of men or women. It has everything to do with what you think about yourself. And so as the law talks about idolatry, and as the law talks about the sin of the flesh, 
we also need to not be afraid to talk about the subject of sexuality. What does God mean in the right way to go about solid male and female relationships? You see, we live in a culture that would scream at me for saying this. In fact, they would say free sex is social liberation. I mean, isn't that what the 60s and 70s was all about? Isn't that that we have lived in an enlightened area where we know more about humanity and so it's just part of how the human is designed. But I have this to say to our culture, free sex is not social liberation. It is not the respect feminists hope to find. In fact, modern culture shows a blatant disregard for the worth of a woman. I mean, you know the ministry of Court of Hope. You know the types of things that we want to move towards and engaging in those that have been trafficked in sexual areas. What's the worth of a human soul? And yet we somehow dabble in trying to make a distinction as we dabble in the physical area in our relationships to say, you're really just not worth it. You're not worth respecting. You're not worth honoring. You're not worth me taking the time to have a conversation with your dad. You're just not worth it. And what woman wants to hear that? Not one. And what the Bible is telling us, what God is telling us is you are worth it. You are worth great treasure. And the man needs to earn the right to engage in a relationship with you. There's modern examples that aren't so uh, hard to swallow. The whole example of dating. So let's just let's have a little fun here. Dating is an exciting thing. Dating is a joyous thing. But guess what, guys? If you're going to invite a girl on a date, you should probably not look like you just got out of bed. Probably. Just a hint. You should probably comb your hair or shave your head, whatever, whatever you do, right? And you should probably look pretty decent. You should probably have a plan, right? To go pick her up and say, hey, we're going to go to this restaurant. And your car should probably not look like a pig pen. It should probably be clean where she's not afraid to sit down in it. I mean, you know, you should probably have some arrangements made. And I think in many ways, in this movement towards equality in culture, we have lost what it means to be noble. We have lost what it means to be chivalrous. We have lost what it means to do what grandpa taught you and open the door and close the door and allow her to be the beauty that she is. That's dating, courtship, winning the the affections of a girl. Now ultimately, where does dating lead? Now this is a difficult question, and many of you may be angry with me as I get to the solution of this thing, and it's not because I just go into the stereotypical church answer. But dating really is for the purpose of finding a spouse. Why, why else do you date? Why is there a difference between friendship and dating? Because dating moves you towards some decisions that move you towards marriage. And so dating needs to be taken seriously. There's a cost to covenant. The new covenant involved the sacrifice of Jesus, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says this, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying, man, I value you, the church. I have betrothed you, and I have presented you as a pure virgin to Christ. My people, you need to see the value of the sacrifice of Christ. Paul obviously is referring to the New Covenant, and he talks about the mystery of marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. 
Jesus obtained a people for himself, the church, by his blood and formed a new covenant with her, an unbreakable marriage. And so as you think about, again, the body of Christ and Jesus, the marriage covenant, which dating precludes, involves personal sacrifice. Engaging in dating involves personal sacrifice. Dating is not selfish. That's not the answer that our culture gives. Dating involves personal sacrifice. And let's be honest. Let's just be practical. There is greater value placed on the things and people that take work. There just is. There is greater value placed on things and people that take work. No honorable guy wants to engage with a quote-unquote easy girl. Easy emotionally, easy physically, easily intellectually, easy any sort of way. Guys want to engage in the beautiful, articulate mystery that is a woman. And so the plain hard to get that phrase, it comes from noble areas. There's a reason that the woman in some ways should play hard to get. Because you are, as a woman, you don't want to tease, you, want to, you don't want to manipulate, you don't want to flirt, those are different areas. But showing that you have value, showing that you have standards, showing that you have structure, showing that you have purpose, showing that you have an a intimate relationship with Jesus, shows the guy, you want this? It's going to cost you. And it should. A lot. And so as you think about the beauty of dating, I want you to think about it in terms of hard to get. Now, Angel was the hardest to get of all hard to get. <laughs> I met Angel my freshman year. We rode on the same bus going to a youth slash college camp. Because we weren't youth anymore, but we were, I was 17, I think. And she was 18. We were young. And I met her, and she was... And she wore, and this is going to date her, and I know that, and that's okay, and you can Google it, because you're not going to know what this means. But this is in 1991, and she was decked out in a belt buckle, and Rocky Mountain jeans, and Roper boots, and let me tell you, that is hot. <laughs> not because she's wearing jeans and it's 100 degrees outside, so I'm just saying. Right? And I was smitten. I was like, oh my goodness. And so this van ride up, I'm trying to be the best flirt that I can, and I'm just an idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. So we kind of flirted. She actually got rebuked. You can't be flirting with freshmen. You're a freshman. What does that look like? And all this kind of stuff. Well, then she got into a serious relationship with a boy, and we won't get into all the details, although it's really funny stories. And the boy would go out of town, and then I would come to Angel and say, okay, your boy's out of town. It's time to have fun now, because they didn't know how to have fun. They were deeply spiritual, and all they ever did was pray. <laughs> and when they went on a fancy date, guess what? They went to Arby's. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so my best friend and I in college, when he would go out of town, which we prayed was often, we would go to Angel's dorm, and I'd be like, Angel, let's go have some fun. Let's go bowling. Let's go to Village Inn. Let's do something exciting. <laughs> This is fun in 1992, right? So we would just have fun, and over the years we developed a friendship, and I've got to go through this because I don't have a lot of time, but we developed a friendship, and then she didn't want anything to do with me in the context of that friendship because she realized, well, there's something else going on here. And she had an agenda, and she had a dream, and she was going to be a missionary in the jungles of Vietnam, and there was no room for a boy in that plan. And here I was saying, you want to date me? I'm really cute. You want to date me? And she's like, no, I don't. I want you to leave me alone. And so it went through this constant movement, constant movement. And I can tell story upon story upon story. But guess what? I did not give up. If anything I learned growing up, it was you don't give up. 
An angel was a treasure worth loving, worth doing whatever I could for her to turn her head, to turn her eye, and to say, wow, he values me. And it scared her because we became best friends, and it scared her because she trusted me unlike she had trusted any other male relationship. And so this movement towards is God creating something beautiful out of this relationship. When it comes to dating, you have to ask yourself the question, am I willing to take a shortcut or not. You see, the penalty for taking a shortcut when it comes to male and female relationships is great because the value of marriage is greater. As you think through dating, as you think through life, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 and 24, here's another one of those obscure verses. When you read it, you're going to go, whoa, this blows my mind. This is intense. This has nothing to do with dating, Chad. Where are you going with this? Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 and 24. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in a city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Verse 29, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all of his days. Again, there's particulars. There's if you do this, this happens. But what's the point of the law? The point of the law is to lift the value of women. The point of the law is to say there are consequences to making shortcuts. That the sexual relationship should happen in committed, moving, relational energy that is both male and female ready for what God has in the future. And that if you take a shortcut, you are denying that woman and God what he designed to be the best. <laughs> And so there's consequences, and the practical consequences, those of you that just like statistics. Se sexual relations outside of wedlock, the passage says, you will pay one year's wage. So, you ready? Right? Those of you that are dating, those of you that are toying with physical relationships, you want to have sex? Cough it up. A year's wage. I think that would be a deterrent. I, I really do. Guys like money. Guys like your toys. Guys like to go out to eat. Guys like to do things. A single guy, you have sex, you pay one year of your wage. A deterrent. It's meant to sting. There's meant to be consequences. Now, it gets a little heavier. In the case of rape, four plus years of wages is what, excuse me, is what is outlined in this. Public defamation of a wife. You can read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 19. Eight plus years of wages. Defamation of a wife. You don't think the scripture is trying to tell us something about the value of women? You don't think scripture is trying to tell us something that once you do win this amazing, gorgeous prize, that you better not respect her as your wife? Eight plus years. You want to put her down in public? You want to make fun of her? You want to put her in situations where she doesn't feel protected, where she doesn't feel led, where she feels exposed? Eight plus years. The Bible is serious about the value of women, about the responsibility of men, about the movement of what does it mean to honor God in relationships. And where did all this money go? Did dad start to drive a Cadillac? Or a really souped up donkey or whatever. <laughs> no. All of this money that was paid to the family was set aside for the care of the woman. Isn't it a beautiful picture of how a society chooses to care for the value of women? If guy takes advantage of you, we're going to put some money away so that you can make a way for yourself. A husband treats a wife inappropriately, we're going to put some money away so that if that loser leaves you, you're going to be supportive. That, that's the point. The value of women continues to move through the law. You see, we as fathers hold a tremendous responsibility when it comes to the value of 
women. Dads, we must be involved. It is a biblical mandate. As I look out at this crowd, there's a lot of you guys that are not dads. And I do not want you to all of a sudden check out because I want you to think about the future. There are many of you dads that you're sitting here thinking, wow, my kids are 10 or 8 or 5 or 3 or 1. The last thing on my mind is marriage. I'm just thinking about when I cannot change a diaper, I would be so excited. Right? But this message is for you and for me and anyone who's ever thinking about being a dad. Dads must be involved. It is the mandate given to us from Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 says this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. I think you've heard that before. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You know what's so beautiful about that verse? There's nothing special about that verse. It's not when you celebrate the graduation from kindergarten, sit down with your child and let them know the magnificence of God. Or when that child learns to drive, then make sure that you sit down and you have a proper conversation about the risks behind the wheel. That, that's not what that verse is about. That verse is, dads, as you breathe, as you live, in the normalcy of life, are you showing your children the beauty of God? Normal. Your kids don't go, oh, there goes dad. He's in his spiritual mode again. Right? Oh, it's Christmas. We better read the Bible. Oh, we're sitting at the table. Well, listen to this. Dad goes on and on and on. No. Normal, natural, consistent leadership in the home towards the movement of God taken on by the dad. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, that's talking about the male-female relationship, but don't you think that extends to the children relationships as well? Are my children not flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone? Are my children not an, an extension of the responsibility that God has put on me? Am I not going to care for them as I would care for myself? Is it not a representation of how Christ cares for the church. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4, which shows you how the intent of families is woven throughout Ephesians. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Dads, as you think about your kids, moms, as you think about your kids' families, as you think about your children, no matter their age, don't avoid the conversations of sex. Don't avoid the conversations of wisdom. Don't avoid the conversations of value and purpose. Teach them to your children. Let your children hear the awkwardness and the quirkiness and, and sometimes the uncomfortableness of a conversation about human sexuality from you. Don't let them hear it first from some moron at school. Be intentional. Be intentional in how you live your life moving your children towards the things of God. That will establish the value of women. Dads, you get scared. Don't look forward to the moment when your daughter has boys who show interest because you need an excuse to clean your gun, right? That's what we think of. Well, I'm ready. I got it in the safe. I'll pull it out. I'll shine it up. You know, I'll start watching NASCAR. I'll feel really good about myself. Let's go. I'm ready. My daughter's of dating age. Where's the line? 
been practicing, right? That, no, you know what, guys? Dads, we need to look forward to those times. We need to be ready, guys. You want to date my daughter? Prove it. And not because I'm carrying a gun. <laughs> but because, guess what? I'm going to have a conversation with you. I'm going to talk to you about life. I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. I'm going to talk to you about why you think my daughter is the best thing since sliced bread. I'm going to talk to you. You want to date my daughter? You better talk to dad. That's what we should be looking forward to. Conversations moving throughout our children's lives of what it means to date, what it means to engage with the opposite sex. Now, I'm probably not going to win any fans in this area, but I typically don't care much about that. So here we go. As I've already said, dating ultimately has one purpose, finding a spouse. There, that, that's why there's a difference between friendship and dating. If you want to just hang out, be a friend. If you want to find a spouse, date. That, that's what it is, right? Our culture tries to define dating as all kinds of things, but I guarantee you, you get to the bottom definition, dating is to find a spouse. Guess what? Dating is hormonally charged. It's psychologically charged. It's physically charged. It's spiritually charged. And guess what? It was designed that way. Dating is meant to get you hot and bothered. It is. That's why you engage in those movements. You're praying together. You're deeply spiritual together. You can't believe she just touched your hand and your whole body moves in tremendous ways. You're having conversation. You're engaged. You're going, whoa, this is a woman worth doing anything for. That's the power of dating. So why would I want my 15-year-old to date? I don't. Or 16. Or 17. Maybe 18. I don't want her to date until she's ready. Them. I have three of them. Until they are ready to understand how to deal with hormonally charged things. Physically charged things. Spiritually charged things. Teenagers shouldn't date. I know that's crazy. You know why? Because they need to develop friendships. They don't need to pair off. They need to enjoy the quality of male-female relationships in a group setting. That's what teenagers need to do. It's not because Chad somehow is on his soapbox. It's because God values men and women. And God wants us to be put in a situation where we, as best as we know how, can control the way he made us. Dating le leads to all kinds of things, which is supposed to lead to marriage, which, guess what, leads to sex. That's the plan. And guess what? Sex is awesome. It is. And as you think through all of these things, Ask yourself, when am I ready to engage, no matter if you're 18 or 25, in a dating relationship? Are you emotionally ready? Are you spiritually ready? Are you hormonally ready? Are you ready to put good boundaries and set quality limits? Are you ready to respect the person that you choose to engage with? Here's the questions that I want you to think through, and I'm actually going to stop and we'll continue this message next week, but to finish tonight at least, so there'll be part two of theme three. How are you as a dad involved in the lives of your children? How are you as a dad involved in the lives of your children? Is your parenting maturing as your children? Are mature. That, that's a big question. Do you look forward to the season of courtship? I've been asking myself this question the last two weeks. Chad, are you really looking forward to that season? And I want to be. I, I want to be there. I want to know the conversations that I want to have with the guys who 
begin to look at my daughters in ways that I'm not quite comfortable with. And so how do I engage in those conversations? Do you have a plan when it comes to leading and protecting your family in this area? Does your treatment of women, this is a big question, dads, husbands, boyfriends, does your treatment of women set the example for your children to follow? When my kids are in my house, do they see me yelling at Angel? Do they see me criticizing Angel? Do they see me treating her as a second class citizen? I mean, you can fill in the blanks. My prayer, my hope, my discipline, my movement is that no, those would never be there. Does that not mean that my children haven't seen me raise my voice? They absolutely have. Does it not mean that my children have seen Angel and I fight? They absolutely have. Does it not mean that my children have not seen me cry or Angel cry? They absolutely have. Because parenting is in front of your children, not behind closed doors. Set the example. And so what are you dads? What are you husbands? What are you potential husbands? doing? What is she worth? Is it worth you taking the time and the energy and the zealousness and the passion to pursue her? Now I'm going to stop for the evening, which is kind of on a cliffhanger, and I hate doing that. But I know some of you have grown up in a home where, guess what? Dad wasn't there. And so, that is where the church comes in. If not that, then the church. And we'll go there next week of how do we, as the body of Christ, continue to support the value of women. 